Welcome to the Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris, and I've been teaching seminary courses for the past 20 or 30 years. And today, we're going to be looking at the question of, have you ever wondered how to get at the original Greek or Hebrew words when you're studying the Bible? What if you don't know Greek or Hebrew? Well, over the past 2,000 years of interpreting the Bible, the church has developed a number of tools to address those very questions. In this video, I want to look at what is a concordance, how is a concordance different from a dictionary, and how does it help you get at the original Hebrew and Greek words? In order to answer these questions, we're going to take a field trip to the local library. Why? Because I gave my concordances away a number of years ago. Silly me. I don't know about you, but I find word studies fascinating. Not only do they help us to understand a passage, but words provide us with some very insightful illustrations and points to teach and remember a passage from. Word studies also help us to grasp complex or difficult concepts. Oftentimes, we think we understand concepts such as miracles or healings in the Bible, and we don't realize the complexity of ideas and concepts which surround such concepts in the New Testament era. Word studies break off those blinders of our eyes and help us to see afresh how rich and complex these ideas and texts are. Finally, word studies are an excellent practice to force us to learn how to use basic reference tools for any form of theological research, in particular, concordances today. History. Concordances are a great example of the labor of love poured into biblical studies over the generations by the church. The first concordance on the Latin Vulgate of the Bible was compiled by Cardinal Hugh of St. Cher. He died around 1260. According to tradition, he employed more than 500 friars to accomplish this task. When he listed a word, he would include the book and chapter reference for those words' locations. Verse references would come later. In 1448, Rabbi Mordecai Natan worked for 10 years to compile a concordance of the Hebrew Bible. The value of concordances took off in the 1500s when Robert Estienne was the first to print the New Testament with standard verse numbers. This allowed the words indexed in the concordance to be linked directly to the verse rather than the general book in which they occurred. In 1737, Alexander Kroon compiled a concordance on the King James Bible, and it's been in print ever since then. What amazes me is that he compiled this by working from 7 a.m. to 1 p.m. every day for over a year to compile his draft of the concordance, and he did this while he owned a bookshop in London. He also incorporated verse references into his concordance, sort of a first in the English language. In the 1800s, we have two big concordances that were produced for English readers, Young's and Strong's concordances. The strength of Young's concordance was the inclusion of Greek or Hebrew words in its index. Now, the thing that we need to realize about Young or Strong is that they did not compile their works from scratch, but build upon the works of those who precede them, sort of like tag team wrestling, where each scholar would pass off the torch to the next generation. James Strong was a professor of ancient languages and Greek New Testament at Troy University and then later Drew University. He lived from 1822 to 1894 and he published his concordance in 1890 and it's been revised ever since then. And in fact, when we go to the library, we're going to look at the new Strong's concordance or a revision of that one that's been done recently. What made Strong's concordance so useful is that he included a reference number or a numbering system to link the English word to the Greek or the Hebrew word. Now, Professor Strong had over a hundred people help him in compiling his concordance. Some Bibles have an abridged concordance at the back of their Bibles, which is very, very useful because then you get to carry it with you, but it is not an exhaustive concordance. It doesn't contain every word. An exhaustive concordance, which contains every word in the New Testament, is a huge book. And we'll take a look at that here in a bit. So if you want a dedicated concordance, it should be keyed to your translation, 
that's what you want. So if you're reading, for example, the English Standard Version, you want a concordance in the English Standard Version. If, when you look at a concordance and you're looking at buying one, it should say right in the title which translation is key to. So you're studying the English Bible. Let me explain to you what Strong's Concordance does. You don't know Greek. So how do you go from studying an English word like world in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, over to the Greek text here, how are you able to understand what the word there is and get a basic preliminary grasp on it? Well, this is where Strong's genius comes in. Let me see if I can reverse engineer what Strong's did for us. First off, we have our Greek text over here. And then we have our English. And you want to get some basic understanding of what's going on in the Greek text. What Strong's did was take the Greek words, for example, in this case, we want to look at the word world, and in the Greek, it's cosmos. What Strong's does is he assigned a number to the basic lexical root of this word. And in this case, it's 2889. Then he takes this and brings it back to the English. And over here in the King James Version, we see in John 3.16, the word world is keyed to this number, and that lets us get at the Greek word. But when we're also looking at the Greek word here, we notice that it also means adorning. So you can see how these two English words using this numbering system that Strong's assigned to the Greek allows us to get back to the Greek word. And then once we're at the original word, then we can come forward and go, oh, you know what, it doesn't mean world all the time, but it can also mean adorning in certain situations. A few moments later. I've had to come over here to the public library because I got rid of my copy of a concordance a few years ago. And I'll explain that in the next video. But until then, I came over here and picked up their copy of the concordance to show you how this works. So what is a concordance? Well, a concordance is basically an index of every word within a particular text. You can get them of Shakespeare's works, the Quran. In our case, we're looking at an index to all the words in the Bible. Because it's an exhaustive index of every word in the Bible, except for a, and, and the, if you want to do word studies, a concordance is an invaluable tool. Now, the first thing to realize is that you want to get a concordance that is keyed to the version of the Bible that you read. You can get them in NIV, New American Standard. This particular one, the New Strong's Concordance, is keyed to the King James Bible. If you read the King James, this is the concordance for you. If you read the NIV or New Revised Standard, this one is not going to be particularly helpful. Most concordances will have three parts. The first part is an index of all the words in your particular translation. The second part at the back is where they give you a dictionary. So the dictionary is in two parts. One for the Old Testament, all the Hebrew words that the English are keyed to. And then the second one is all the Greek words that the English words are keyed to. And I'll show you how this works in a second. So, for example, if you wanted to see all the places where the word love is used in the King James Bible, you can flip to it, look it up just like a dictionary, and here it is, love. And we have got almost a page and a half of references to the use of the word love in the King James Bible. Because a concordance is an index of all the uses of a word in that particular translation, they are invaluable for doing word studies. Now, the genius that Strong's came up with was including a numbering system. So he just doesn't show you where the words occur in the English translation, but he has a number here that is keyed to these dictionaries at the back, to the Hebrew or to the Greek. Some concordances will actually put a little H or a G in front of the number to let you know that's a Hebrew or a Greek dictionary you should be looking at. This numbering system is then what allows you to actually do word studies on the Greek or the Hebrew words 
without knowing the language. So, how do you use a concordance to do word studies? First off, you find the word that you want to use in your English text, the verse you're looking at. In this case, I want to look up the word world in John 3.16. So I come over to world, I scroll down here until I find John 3.16, and we find that it is word 2889. Now let's go back to our Greek dictionary, 2889, as I was telling you. We flip back to the Greek dictionary. They've got a little Greek thing here on the side that's very helpful to let you know that we're in the Greek dictionary. Otherwise, you can get very lost, as I have in the past, trying to look up a Greek word in the Hebrew. It doesn't get you very far. At the very start of the definition here, it tells you how this word is used in the translation. An orderly arrangement, a decoration, the world in a narrow sense, it's an inhabited world, adorning, um, and so it's used as an adorning one time and as world 186 times. So we see dominantly the way it is. And then we get the definition of the word here underneath. In the past, these definitions weren't very good at all. But in these new revised versions of the concordances, these definitions are pretty good because what they've done is they've taken sort of definitions from Hebrew lexicons, from Vine's Expository Dictionary, and in this case, they've also taken some stuff from Bauerach Ingrich's lexicon of the New Testament. These dictionaries are really to give you a jump start or a start on your word study. It's not meant to be sort of the definitive end all of what this word means. Now what's interesting, if I go back to the A's and look up under adorning, and there we have it. It's listed in 1 Peter 3.3 3, twice, and look at that, the number is 2889. That's our Greek word. And if we come over to 1 Peter 3.3, 3, I know, being rather anachronistic here, using a print version of the concordance and an electronic version of the text, but 1 Peter 3.3 3 reads, whose adorning let it not be outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or putting on of apparel. So the word cosmos, though it usually means world or something physical, where people live, the world in which we live, creation, something like that. Here, in 1 Peter 3.3, 3, it refers to adornment. Now think about this for a second, because this is rather interesting. In English, we use this the same way. We talk about cosmetics. In other words, we use the Greek root cosmos here for cosmetics, makeup, what we put on, which is the same way as 1 Peter 3.3. 3. Now, most concordances or software programs or various resources like Bible dictionaries will be keyed to probably the Strong's numbering system. However, there's a more recent numbering system called the goodrich Kohlenberg or GK numbering system. Now, this is a newer numbering system developed, I think, in the 1980s that includes more Greek and Hebrew words than Strong's used. When you're looking at a concordance or these resources, just realize they are either based on Strong's or GK numbering system. In the next video, we're going to take a look at how Bible software takes concordances and indexing features like this to the next step, the next logical progression, and what you can do with that. We're going to do kind of a versus video. It's Strong's versus software. Who is the ultimate winner? Well, maybe not quite that dramatic, but you get the idea. So stick around to see the next video, and until we meet again, peace.